Hey, how's it going? Good. No, no, it's not offensive. Not offense. It meant to be offensive, but it's like when I'd rather be at a this meeting than at work. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you would. Janet, we have one minute to go, and I know you mentioned that Marie Catherine is unable to join us today. Have we heard from Jennifer? You're Sorry, muted. Janet, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, I uh, working between two screens here in the office, so um, <laughs> I have not heard from anybody else. Okay, and Janet, unfortunately, the message uh, came up that so we had to hit for a record, so I just missed what you said, but I think you said you hadn't heard from anyone beyond Mary Catherine. Okay. No, I have not. Okay, and since it is the appointed hour of 3 p.m. and we do have a fairly hefty agenda today, I do believe I will call this meeting to order. We do have quorum, so uh, let's begin. And welcome everyone who's with us. I really appreciate, we've had such rainy weather and here we have a beautiful day. And of course that's the day that we have to bring you into your, into your computer. So thank you all for taking time to be with us this afternoon and especially to our Mayor, I see Mayor Compass is with us, and to anyone who might be tuning in on uh, YouTube, welcome. So with that being said, we'll begin with a moment of reflection. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest around the committee table? I'm seeing none at this point. Uh, please remember that if you feel later on there's a need to declare, you can always do that at any point during the meeting. Mm -hmm. Public participation, I'll, I'll read this piece for the benefit of anyone listening. Members of the public are encouraged to provide the committee with their comments and questions. Presentations must be prearranged with legislative services before the agenda is released. Presentations are limited to 10 minutes and deputations to five minutes. The public is currently unable to attend committee meetings due to provincial restrictions. If a member of the public wishes to make a deputation on an agenda item, they may do so remotely by phone or through the internet. Members of the public wishing to make a deputation must register with legislative services in advance by 4 p.m. on the day prior to the meeting. And they can contact uh, the clerk by email at uh, deputyclerk at meeker.ca or 519-538-1060. And the public can watch the meeting through our YouTube site at www.meeker.ca slash YouTube. So that uh, I'll confirm, Janet, then we have uh, no deputations today, but we do have a presentation. And we have Melissa Twist with us. Welcome, Melissa. And Melissa's from South Georgian Bay Tourism. And I know this is a committee that Janet sits on. And uh, we heard at the last meeting that you're going to join us today. So welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Oh, and welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about South Georgian Bay Tourism. My name is Melissa and I am the Director of Regional Tourism for South Georgian Bay Tourism. Next slide. Our organizational role. South Georgian Bay Tourism, formerly known as Georgian Triangle Tourism Association, was established in 1978. South Georgian Bay Tourism is an in-destination education organization whose role is to enhance the visitor experience through seamless connections between visitors and unique products and experiences. Next slide. Our brand promise is to gently nudge and guide visitors within the region to seize their day by discovering unique places, activities, experiences, and people. Next slide. 
South Georgian Bay Tourism will perform these functions by coordinating regional visitor services digitally and in person, creating in-destination content and fulfillment, developing routes, best ofs, and top tens by bundling niche experiences, and leveraging partnership with the business community. What differentiates South Georgian Bay Tourism is our consistent regional marketing. We are an association that brings our regional partners together. SGBT is unique as it brings our five municipal partners together to have collaboration between the areas. During COVID-19, collaboration has been a common theme and is something that the association has been doing for years. Collaboration brings benefits such as synergy, sharing resources, overcoming obstacles and increasing awareness to the area. We work in partnership with MIFR Chamber and find ways to collaborate when possible, sharing resources and working together. Next slide. South Georgian Bay Tourism developed a recovery and resiliency plan in 2020 to help support the local business community that was separated into three phases with four main pillars, safety protocol and education, providing local businesses with information necessary to provide uh, properly follow government regulations, leadership and consistent messaging, acting as a leader for South Georgian Bay and bringing people together to use that consistent messaging in order to give clear information with the public. Marketing, focusing on inbound marketing and ensuring people feel safe when they're in the community, giving them things that they can see at each stage, ensuring they follow government regulations and ambassadors using our local businesses and members of the community to help promote the area through social media. Next slide. South Georgian Bay Tourism was able to leverage a TIO grant, leveraging money through the RTO7 funding and our Google grant to over 100,000. SGBT immediately responded to help support local tourism business regardless of membership. We worked on several different marketing initiatives such as ambassador staff, feast on great taste of Ontario, video marketing, digital campaigns through Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, working with influencers and bloggers and also radio campaigns. And I'll go into some of these initiatives in the next slide. Next slide. Um, we were, this is an example of one of many of one of the influencer bloggers that we hosted in the South Georgian Bay area. Um, they were able to um, enjoy downtown Meaford and get out to one of the restaurants. So this is a little bit of a, her write up, uh, Hot Scotch the Globe on her dining experience in Meaford. Next slide. Here's also a fun little campaign that we did, Live Like a Local, with some catchy, fun animals and sayings um, that we did last year. Next slide. We did a digital marketing campaign, which we called the Nor New, Nor uh, New Normal campaign. In total, this campaign served over 400,000 impressions, generated 4,592 clicks for an overall click-through weight of 1.07. We also received a total of over 100,000 views um, and an impressive view for view, view rate of 28.85. Next slide. South Georgian Bay Tourism was also excited to announce complimentary listings for the entire tourism industry and our partnering municipalities for 2021. The most important for our membership is the complimentary listing. This is the single largest shift from our old model to our new. We announced that we're offering complimentary basic listings to all tourism related businesses and SGB as a pilot for 2021. A radical shift inspired by COVID-19 and the need to help businesses in a new way. We are well positioned to promote and support the tourism sector for as long as the recovery takes. Information marketing. We created and shared local stories embracing all there is to see and do in this amazing region. These will take, they were take place in various forms as you, uh, unique, unique experiences in the latest top 10 lists. SGBT was also excited to announce the launch of our 2021 Digital Four Seasons Guide, all that great local tourism content that travelers are used to seeing, but in a handy digital form. And I'll go into this in more detail in a later slide. Next slide. Membership. 
SGBT has had a steady membership year over year with 15 new members for 2021 in Meaford. And that number is still growing. With the, with the change of our association model, we have been able to maintain our enhanced members as there is now a reduced rate to continue membership with the association, which has made it more attainable for businesses as their marketing budgets have been drastically affected due to COVID-19. It has been a very slow start to the year as we're now in the seventh month of the year and most businesses have only been able to operate for just over two months in 2021. When talking about the future, a lot of businesses are feeling overwhelmed and are just focusing on the immediate. Members are truly the heart of our association. We have strong retention at SGBT as our members understand the importance of the association. We have members that have been part of our association for over 30 years. We have monthly check-ins with their membership and give them the opportunity to speak directly to our board of directors about their concerns and feedback. It is important to be part of SGBT because you are part of a community, not just in your own municipality, but for the whole region of South Georgian Bay. We continue to drive leadership from writing advocacy letters to different members of government on behalf of our membership base, base and also being part of working groups such as South Georgian Bay Tourism Advisory Task Force that was reporting directly to the ministry on recommendations on how they can support the tourism industry. Next slide. Education. We were able to lead, uh, lead projects and communication efforts to benefit our membership and stakeholders, which differentiates SGB in the travel market. We were able to host the tourism mini conference and plan on hosting the conference again this year. We have also added a dedicated page on our website uh, focused on educating tourism related businesses as well as social platforms so that tourism related business kids, businesses can stay up to date on those resources. And the last one, revenue generation, establishing re revenue generation opportunities for the organization through content partnership. Next slide. So we are going to continue R&R into 2021 and here are some of the initiatives. Um, our Google AdWords, this is year round campaigns to include road trip getaways, four seasons destination activities, fall experiences, and we have an annual budget of over 168,000. Content marketing, again, that's that year around writing and sharing content, showing content to people based off of their interests. Video marketing, again, year round, creating 15 videos using progressive storytelling te techniques. Photo marketing, again, year round, photo shoots to enhance that storytelling content. And digital marketing programs, content specific ads, highlighting content on our website, driving leads to those member profiles. Next slide. This is just a quick slide to give you an overview of our Google Ad Word monthly budget and our overall annual budget for the year. Next slide. Wanted to show you some examples. This is um, just a few of some of the um, content that we write and that we include Meaford in it. So must to do's in Meaford. So we call it our local secrets, but it's our weekly blog, historic hikes and biking in South Georgian Bay. Next slide. So to go into a little bit more detail about our Four Seasons Digital Guide, um, visitors will start to see QR codes in high traffic areas around the region so that they can download the guide will be easy for visitors and help steer them around this amazing region. The Four Seasons Guide is a dynamic platform that provides destination information and travel tools to visitors easily and efficiently. The guide offers a safe environment for visitors to explore the area and provide them with travel options. SGBT wanted to create a guide that was dynamic, user-friendly, and provided interactive content about all the great things there is to see in this Four Seasons destination. Due to the changes in travel behavior, we needed to reimagine the guide for the future that is more technology-based. Next slide. SGBT was also excited to announce the launch of its newest partnership, Aim to helping empower its locals and visitors with safe tourism while enhancing their exploration experience with the Driftscape app, a Canada-based tourism app company. 
With over 20 South Georgian Bay highlights currently mapped on Driftscape app and more to come, locals and visitors of the Bay are now able to tour, explore and discover the heritage of Collingwood, the quaint village of the Blue Mountains and Meaford, the sandy shores of Wasega Beach and the rustic charm of Clearview and many other and its hidden gems from the comfort of their fingertips, a, green a game changing appro approach to tourism. The app will also enable our member organizations to create self-guided tours across the local area, deliver valuable and real-time information, notify visitors about unique local businesses and tourism highlights that surround them as they explore the region, and also couch surf and discover various places within or outside their region from the Driftscape app. Next slide. SGBT is recognized as a four season tourism destination working to enhance support and strengthen experiential tourism products and offerings. The key message is that even though we provide sophisticated digital tourism marketing initiatives, we still have feet on the street to respond to direct inquiries at key tourist attractions with our ambassador staff. Next slide. Here's just a quick snapshot of our social media and our overall reach. You can see we have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We also have a newsletter that has over 3000 subscribers as well as our, um, our Google ad campaigns as I mentioned before. A lot of these years campaigns were focused on the local market um, but when travel restrictions were lifted we had a focus on our primary and secondary markets. Our primary market is 70% is within 120 minute drive from South Georgian Bay area regions with the majority of these visitors resulting from the greater Toronto area. And our secondary market is 30% traveling from Southwestern Ontario regions. Next slide. Now I'd like to open it up to any questions. Next slide. And thank you for looking. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Thanks very much, Melissa, for your presentation. And I'll, as you suggest, open it up to the members of the committee if there are any questions for Melissa. Jennifer, please go ahead. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks, Melissa, very much for um, the presentation. I had a question about um, what you, like whether you did any tracking with um, things last summer, because I, I know the, the past seven months have have been a lot of shut down and things like that but um last summer there seemed to be a, a swell in tourism from the toronto area when when people were trying to get out of the city and i was i was wondering if you had tracked that or mapped anything out about how how the tourism had changed um during that time and are you talking specifically to the um, information we would have collected with our ambassador program feed on the street or set with some of our digital campaigns uh, either one. Okay. So yeah, so we definitely um, across the board saw people that would typically not be coming to this area to travel that they would, you know, be going overseas and they're like, I've never, even though I live two hours or three hours from this area, I had no clue. So there was a lot of that and going out of their comfort zone and, and doing things just outside to be outside. I, um, uh, specifically with a lot of our outdoor operators, there was a lot of, um, you know, with Free Spirit Tour and some of our boating uh, charter companies, a lot of people that were going out of their comfort zone, never have done that before in their life, um, but wanted to just be outside and, and be out in the area. So uh, definitely seeing a unique group of people. And we're finding that again, um, this year that uh, we're getting people that would typically wouldn't travel within Ontario um, that are coming from the surrounding areas because it's close and convenient. And, and what are you finding that they're specifically interested in or is it, it a range? What are they doing while they're here? That it's might be of, different from, from, sorry, that might yeah. be different from what they were, they was happening before. Yeah, so a lot of wanting to go to the outdoor spaces. So hiking, biking, um, wanting to go to the water, it's very popular beaches. Um, so all the natural areas tend to be very, very popular. And sorry, just one more follow-up question before I, I'll, I'll pass it on to somebody else, but how um, is, is that, 
encouraging a pivot to a different direction in the future or or how do you think think things are are going to look post pandemic in terms of your target market I think that we're continuing to drive stories and itineraries, um, still targeting those groups, but really having a focus on, yeah, come up here, enjoy a beautiful hike or a bike ride, but promote um, promote um, our local operators while doing it. So make sure to jump into this downtown and support these local retail shops or go into this cafe to grab your lunch or go here for your dinner. Um, we're really, really kind of dri driving that in to come visit, but we also want you to promote um, our local operators. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else a question for Melissa? Reed? Yes, thank you very much, Melissa, for your presentation. Um, uh, I have a number of questions, but I guess the first uh, and primary is five partners. Who, who are those five partners? With Sega Beach, Clearview Township, Collingwood, the Town of Blue Mountains, and the Municipality of Newburgh. Great. Um, I'm interested to know uh, on your marketing, how much is directed to the trade aspect, so the operators, uh, versus consumer? And you're looking for like a uh, like a percentage, right? So that's oh, something. percentage, yes, dollars, like whatever you can. It's a hard question because um, it's something that we're really trying to um, moving forward with our ca campaigns have metrics around all of them, so we can report back very deep detail um, around that. Um, so just can you uh, um, ask the question again, sorry. Okay, so I wondered what the uh, percentage of focus was on the trade or the operators mm -hmm. versus consumer. So a lot of our, uh, like the majority of our sto stories are focused around our membership base. Okay. So the operators, I would say 90% 90, 90 of it would be. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in the past, I know that the province ran some education programs, and I'm going back quite a few years now, but they, they ran a program called We Treat You Royally. And every operator uh, would take sort of a program and they'd have a sticker on the door that said, we treat you royally. And you knew that the uh, trade inside knew exactly, you know, how to treat tourists and, you know, exchange on dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are you thinking that you would ever offer anything like that? So we would typically work with our partners on that. So the Tayo industry um, had a, a focus on safe tourism and they were doing a similar type thing where they had um, a sticker um, or something you'd put on your website to show that you're practicing that safe element. So typically we would work with our partners, um, our larger partners like Tayo on promoting an initiative like that. So it's um, Ontario wide and not just focused um, on South Georgian Bay region. So um, I can speak to that last year where we worked in partnership with Tayo to promote that through our newsletters and our social media campaigns. Um, and when speaking directly to our membership of the importance of getting that um, certification so that they can have that represented on their, wherever it may be in their front window or on their website, that sort of thing. Right. I'm encouraged. I think that uh, that's you're doing a great job. And I think that uh, anything we can do to reach out to some of the operators and, and increase their awareness and education uh, is really, really helpful. So continue what you're doing. And um, if you can do anything regarding standardized hours or how to reach out uh, during the holiday period, I think that that's really, really important. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Reid. Eric, I think I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation as well. Um, I just um, was thinking um, for the complexity of your apps um, that you're involved in, do any of them, uh, I think it was the first one that you mentioned that I'm thinking of. Yeah, so we just, the four yeah, Driftscape app, we just launched actually okay. in, um, in April. So it's relatively new to us. Okay. And we thought, 
why don't we kind of get into this game, see what it's about and see. And so we really don't, I don't have right now because we've just, just really started to promote it coming out of this lockdown, mm-hmm. any stats to report back on it, but I'm really excited okay. to at the end of the year to kind of see how is it going and how many downloads we're getting and how people are using it. Are there any um, like, uh, like, AI sort of algorithmic features that will read into the user's social media likes and interests so that it might be able to target like, you know, if we know that that person likes coffee, it would recommend them the coffee shop as opposed to just sort of a random spread. Is there any of those sort of self targeting automated features. Um, so I'm working actually with the app to, uh, to figure that out now that we can start actively promoting it. Um, so yes, that is a, um, a feature of it. Cool. Um, so I'm excited to be able to dive into that and, and, and see how exactly it, it will all work out. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great questions, Eric. Thank you. Rob. Yes, I'll, I'll echo the uh, thanks and also echo the admiration. Been long, actually, fan of what you do for tourism in the area. I know I, through other entities I'm involved with, I certainly use your platform for um, your calendaring, for example. And and I just have a question on that regard because it's it's come up many times through uh, various entities again within municipality about just ways of getting our our calendar more seen. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any synchronicity possibilities of sharing that kind of thing. Uh, also, I just wonder whether, because what you displayed in your um, presentation was you've obviously been able to quantify, uh, and that's great. So I'm just wondering, do you have any feel for how successful your events calendar is in promotion um, in terms of, w- without getting into actual numbers of hits regardless, but has that been a, a really successful tool um, the events calendar unto itself. Yes, for sure. So now I have to kind of go back to prior to COVID-19. So we always want to work with our partners. So if there's someone that, um, I need to be connecting on, on, on your side of things, because we, as staff, every morning we spend a certain amount of time going to those key partners websites to make sure that we have the most up-to-date events or festivals or farmers markets information on our events platform. So, Um, We definitely want to make sure that we're seeing it and that we're putting it on our platform. So in terms of success, we were working with a lot of our large accommodators in the area. So prior to COVID-19, we would do a Thursday morning event newsletter that would go out to over 3000 subscribers. A lot of um, those key people were um, working at the front desk at some of the larger accommodators in the area and would use our newsletter as a resource when talking to guests because we would have that following weekend um, that that weekend and the following week so when guests are asking what is there to do in this area this weekend or this week that I'm up here um, they're taking information from our newsletter and our website so that was amazing to hear and I want to just continue hopefully when we start to be able to have more events and festivals start happening again build off of that Um, because I think it's great that we're not just speaking to one particular area. We're talking about the entire region and it's all so close. It's all, you know, so, you know, so easy for someone to go down highway six, 30 minutes to go see a great performance in Meaford or that sort of thing. If they're based out of Collingwood for the week. So I hope that answered. It's long winded. (laughs) No, it it did. That was great. Rising waters with all boats. So it's nice that it's, uh, it's kind of, tying in the whole region and that's brilliant. So that's, that's what we want, more feet on the ground, more tourists, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rob Armstrong, I see you're off mute. Would you like to chime in? Yeah, actually, I was just gonna expand on, on Eric's question uh, or comment about uh, AI. And um, we have another tourism partner, Melissa and so the Georgia Bay is one great one because it expands beyond Uh, county boundaries, but we also have Gray County and they do a lot of assessment with regard to artificial intelligence and and providing that information on the tourists and things like that. And I think maybe that's something for the future as well as we look at tourism and understanding it. it, It's great information that's provided. I think uh, Brian Plumstead's been to council and shared that with council as well, just uh, 
think the information's out there and will continue to be built on and that's great information to use for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And we work with Brian um, on exactly to your point with the Envronics and kind of feeding information to him so that he can give us back those great reports. So we typically would work with partners on projects like that. That's great to know, Melissa. Thank you. I was thinking along those same lines. Um, one question I have for you, if I may, as we look at visitor information services, it's probably four -ish years ago now, we had a small subcommittee that was looking at uh, how those services were delivered in this area. And, and as a group of us uh, went out and, uh, as you say, feet on the street, we got out into other communities to see how uh, they were delivered. And we found that every community had an actual visitor information center with an actual person inside. And I'm just wondering what your sense or your perspective is now through and coming out of the pandemic. You mentioned a bit of a focus digitally, which is totally understandable. I'm just wondering what uh, your sense is going forward. Do you see a return to that, um, to that need, to that desire to have that face-to-face -face communication between tourists and uh, somebody representing the community, or do you think it's going to remain a digital focus? Um, so that is something that our board of directors is actually discussing right now. We're going through a strategic planning process, and that is something where um, there has been conversations both ways, where a lot of folks might say that the in-person brick and mortar visitor center is super important where there's an other group that's saying, no, we need to focus more on the digital space. So it's gonna be interesting going through um, uh, that process with my board of directors. So I can't really speak much to it now, but um, I think that through that process that will become very clear on where the future of uh, SGBT uh, goes if it is moving uh, back to a more of a brick and mortar in person information or focusing more on the digital space. Thanks, Melissa. And, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more about that from Janet. And Janet, I think you got your, your hand up. I, I did because um, I, I think, too, speaking to the ambassador program that Melissa spoke to is. is it's an important program because it is getting boots on the ground, but it's, I think it's the strategic of where they're located and when. And I think that's been the key thing through COVID where when Melissa talks about um, having where people are focused on going and where those hotspots are and being able to reach them in those locations and providing the information that they need to know in order to have an enjoyable and safe experience while they're visiting the area. Um, I think those are the key things. And there's been certainly because of COVID, I think there's been some innovation in talking about who are your, your ambassadors for those information services? Is it one spot, a bricks and mortar spot, or are there other folks that actually play into that as being ambassadors? And, and certainly, you know, we talked about the county and, and what Brian um, Hamza has been doing with trying to get out with his ambassador program to getting to different trails. I mean, there's been some fantastic discussions on who are your other ambassadors in the communities. So, you know, an example I look at is, is that if we have um, our people at the front gate of Memorial Park and we've got a lot of visitors coming in there, potentially that's an ambassador location in the sense that people are coming in, they're asking questions, they're looking for information. And just by complimentary of what that person's providing for service, there is some ambassador um, activities happening in that case or maybe you know in some communities are using the bylaw officers because they're around they're talking they're talking about COVID safety and ambassadorship is just kind of a natural um, piece of that as well so I think there, it, that's kind of a it's a broader question of how to handle that from the people on the ground and then also looking at those folks who are more digitally based and just want to have their digital so, and I think you're probably going to have a mix of both of those going forward we're just trying to figure out what that right mix is at that board level um, for the South Georgian Bay Tourism Group. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to this group, why it's so great that Melissa has come to this meeting is the fact that, um, you know, there's so much great work that is being done. And, and we've talked at this group already about the importance of tourism. And, and that's why it was timely to have her come in and, and talk about what's being done with tourism from her perspective. And we've talked a lot about that regional looking at that regional perspective, and she's hitting on that regional perspective. Um, I think the other really important thing is, is that she's been really boots on the ground trying to get more businesses and operators within our municipality to be part of the membership, because 
Um, and, the, and that is growing. And I think this is a spot where maybe even this group can help support and being advocates uh, in talking to people and saying, hey, this is a free membership. This is where you want to be. Because as you can see from the, the touch throughs and, and the reach that she's getting, that's a positive reach. And, and that's really good for our local businesses and economy. So I just wanted to highlight that. Really important, Janet. Thank you very much. So Melissa, I think we'll let you go. I think we can carry on this discussion for a good long time. But uh, anyway, we'll move on with our agenda. Thank you so much for being with us. And perhaps you can come and join us again another time. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for all the great questions. Thank you. Bad. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Um, we'll move on in the agenda to uh, approval of the minutes. Uh, first of all, I'll ask for a mover and a seconder for accepting the minutes. Jennifer, and could I have a seconder? Eric, thank you very much. And I'll ask if there's any comment on the minutes, although I was going to suggest only if the committee agrees, uh, because the next point in our agenda is work plan. And I know there's a lot of points in the minutes about the work plan. So I'm just going to suggest we kind of bypass that discussion in the minutes right now and address that in items for consideration, if that's okay with everyone. And then I was going to ask just other than that, if there was anything in the minutes that anyone wanted to bring forward at this point. And seeing nothing, then I'll ask for and all in favor to accept the minutes as presented. Thank you very much. All good. Thank you. So that being said, we'll move into items for consideration with work plan finalization being first on that part of the agenda. So I'll turn the floor over to Janet now, who's going to work, walk us through the work plan updates and uh, deck prioritization. Janet, over to you. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to share the screen if I can. Um, Hannah or Derek, can you give me access to share screen? Yeah, just give me one second. I have to make you a co-host. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Derek. So the first thing I've pulled up is our work plan and hopefully everybody can see that. So I'm gonna scroll down here. Really um, listening to the conversation from our last meeting, um, the main thing that we were really talking around with the work plan that I wanted to show on the work plan today is around the goal. So there was a lot of um, significant discussion on talking about what a goal is and what were the areas that we wanted to focus on for a goal and, and um, being respectful of the fact that we wanted an umbrella statement that highlighted the fact that really everything in the economic development strategic plan, the priorities laid out and the actions laid out in there are our priorities um, and that there was a need for an umbrella statement to kind of highlight that, that there are all these actions to do, but we need to focus on something that uh, we can achieve within this committee with the time that we have together uh, and the allotment. Um, so what I had done is, is I'd taken everybody's comments and, and actually for the fun of it, decided to listen to the entire meeting again to make sure I captured everything. Um, and I had highlighted an overall statement that you'll see in here uh, for your consideration. And it, it talks about recognizing that all action items identified by the Economic Development Task Force in the Economic Strategic Plan I'm sorry, I've got to move my thing here, are important to accomplish over the next three years and understanding that there's limited time available in 2021 as a committee to meet, EDAC shall focus their efforts on the remainder of this year on offering advice and decision making, which directly assists municipal council and staff. And I put that there strategically because a lot of the discussion points that you had outlined in the last meeting was around assisting council and assisting staff. Um, so I thought that was really key to having that overall umbrella statement. Uh, so in, in supporting businesses, agriculture, community, and the public at large. And again, in your conversations, you were very um, 
vocal on the importance of supporting all of these groups. So when you're looking at different initiatives and actions and your, your objectives as a committee, you've got all of these different groups in mind uh, in your decision making and uh, consideration process. And then um, I've still got the four points in there that were discussed. So identifying uh, a vision for the official plan, pursuing actions uh, that address economic hardship due to COVID-19 and foster long-term economic growth. So those were two points. So pursuing economic hardship was one bullet point that the committee had identified and the second one being long-term economic growth. I've put them together. Um, continuing efforts to enhance communication engagement as required in the communication strategy. So again, there's two bullet points around communications. That's all been wrapped into uh, one bullet point on the importance of communication engagement. And then the last one being establishing a clear municipal identity uh, and opera opera operationalizing that identity uh, with the various departments within the municipality. So I've highlighted those bullets. Now, ultimately, these are not goals. Like if we looked at SMART goals that had very specific um, uh, outcomes and, and are measurable. And you'll see I've put some bullet points there because we had a lot of discussion and we ended up parking lotting um, how to deal with measurable because the outcomes of, of the actions that this group works on, um, you want to see measurements. And I, I think as we dive into a little bit more on figuring out those detailed actions that you want to work on, you'll be able to then come back and have identify on a case by case what those measurements are. So I've just kind of highlighted that in there because I think that there is still more work to do to talk about what are those very specific actions that we want to work on. In this bullet points that we do have, like I would say your official plan, the visioning, participating in that, that's a very, to me, very clear, can be a very clear goal and an action item. Um, but I think that these other bullet points really need to be looked at in more detail to figure out what exactly is the action to achieve these. So does, does that make sense? Is there any comments on that? Just if I may jump in, Janet, in, in relation to the communication strategy, I believe we're expecting that before, I'm sorry, before council in September? Correct. And wondering if that uh, strategy could also come to this group perhaps for uh, comment in around that time frame. What we could do is have um, our next meeting for this group is September, right? We don't have a meeting planned in August. Um, so perhaps what we can do is come in in September and give um, an overview and, and maybe I can provide a presentation to the committee of what the communication strategy is about. Yep, I think that would be good. And uh, just because you've mentioned August, I think later in the meeting, we'll um, just take a consensus and see perhaps if the group feels we should meet in August or if we're uh, uh, content to wait until September. So we'll, we'll address that point later on. Okay, I'm not seeing any more comments on this. So I think what we need to do is, I don't think we need to, to belabor our time um, on this piece and um, the committee can take it away and think about it more and provide me with any input that they want. Um, but I, we've got the bones of, of what the group wants to look at. And I think that as we go through and really start to figure out those areas of focus in the time, in the time allotted, um, that we need to keep coming back. I think it's important to keep coming back to this to make sure that we're hitting on what this group wants to achieve as a goal. So the other thing then, um, sorry, through the, the chair, am I, am I allowed to move on to the next? I'd like to kind of move on to the next piece on the priorities. Absolutely. So I'm going to share screen with you again. So in the work plan, um, based on discussions at our last meeting um, and what was prioritized as items of importance to this committee, I have put together here in a, in a summary. And 
So I've highlighted all the ones that the committee felt were important from the Economic Development Strategic Plan. And then I've also added in at the bottom ones, the additional items identified by um, this committee as being important that were in addition to um, the actual Economic Development Strategic Plan. And I think there's some work here as well to go through and just focus on how those, what those actions would be and how they'd be achieved. And I've started for the committee just in working through and thinking about that for you. Um, I started to write some notes in the side to just to, to help facilitate that discussion and um, trying to, to support in, in our, our decision-making efforts. So just as an example, you know, the, the first one that the committee's identified as a priority is ensuring that local events and activities encourage and build community cohesiveness. Um, so what does that mean? What are the actual action items that would come out of that? And I've just, I've put to the side some of my notes of, okay, the municipality is already meeting with events groups. Uh, out of that meeting, you know, there, we've had discussions about putting together a guide to help support events so that when they're planning, they, they know what resources they need, what, um, how to uh, activate volunteers, um, what forms they would need if they're going to be on municipal lands, what they need to know for COVID. So that's one way to try to, as an action item out of this, that we can support uh, achieving this uh, overall priority while um, actually having a tangible item come out of it. So that was one of my, my suggestions. Um, we've had the economic, or sorry, South Georgian Bay having um, Lisa come in. I mean, that's great as an action so that we can understand what um, the South Georgian Bay, um, oh, sorry, I'm thinking South Georgian Bay, uh, tourism, sorry. South Georgian Bay Institute is another group that I like to bring in um, and have talked to this group because of the arts and culture piece. And, um, understanding what they do and seeing what are there might be for partnerships and, and things like that there. The other uh, thing that was talked about at this group is an event calendar and app. So um, certainly we just talked about that with Melissa and how event calendars work. Um, this group has talked about the importance of event calendar and apps. So maybe there's some more discussion around that as an action item. Um, highlighted the transportation master plan was another one I made a note for the transportation master plan we know that right now the um, bulk of that document is actually in final uh, stages of, of being approved and but I know that there's a little bit of an extra additional piece of work there to be done for rural roads and bridges and things like that so that's something that I think that as a takeaway um, I can go back and figure out what that timing is and how this committee might be able to participate in that additional little work to be able to understand what it means and how that supports our economic development sector when it comes to roads and bridges for agriculture. The attainable housing strategy and the next one uh, as far as for retention and traction programs uh, through an attainable housing strategy. There was discussions at the last meeting that this might fall out more under the once the official plan um, visioning is done and the plan, the official plan lays out what the overall strategy is, that these pieces are the tools that help to implement the official plan and that these, these would be within that. So we may need the official plan piece to happen first to help support these pieces and moving them forward. Uh, the other comment I'd put in was uh, there was a priority to invest in our downtown harbor area and building on stronger synergies between it and the downtown. So uh, again, we're, the municipality is already investing in uh, the continued implementation of that master plan. Maybe from this group, it's you know that ongoing support of uh, budgets that helps to facilitate that so that um, those different phases of the master plan are being implemented. Um, this group may be too, you know, we've got wayfinding signage, uh, banners, those types of things that help to connect the two areas. Those might be some of those types of action items that can support and facilitate between the two um, to achieve that further investment and that connectivity. And the other one I put a comment to is the, the um, mix, so the business mix and the importance of that and really um, that's a, a tangible item that we want to be able to achieve and, and I want to reach back out to the county to figure out where 
they might be at with the plan because we're in phase two of that for them um, because that'll be a really important for one for us to complete. The other ones, I, I've, like I said, I've taken a first step of what my thoughts might be for how we achieve some of these actions or some of these initiatives. Um, for this group, there's other ones here that you might have some ideas for, or even you know, adding on to my ideas. And, and I think there, there needs to be some more discussion on, on what, those, what those tangible action items are and how this group wants to proceed. Sir, any questions on this? Um, Janet, if I may, just thinking of our time restraints, and I know we mentioned earlier about kind of focusing on recommendations for the official plan for the next um, few months, I'll say. So that would take these items then um, into our agendas following the official plan. Is that your thinking? And at that point, we might kind of dissect how we might uh, attack them? Well, I'm wondering if this is a bit of a takeaway too. And, and I wanted to bring it up with this group so that you can think about it and have a little bit more of a look at it and, and take it away, digest it, and think about how, where we might go with this. Because I, there is certainly more discussion needed. And I agree that for today, we wanted to focus on making sure that with the official plan, um, because that's obviously a very much of an immediate need and it's got a very uh, immediate timeline with it, that that's where we wanna focus our immediate efforts. But I don't wanna have this other stuff being too far in the rear view mirror because um, you know there are some stuff that can happen in tandem and, and certainly with phasing and matching things in, we wanna be able to do that. So perhaps this is a, a takeaway and um, people can provide me with comments and we bring that back to the next meeting again. Like we, we gotta keep this in the forefront. I agree. So I think we've got homework then. Janet's asking us to uh, have another look at uh, this particular piece of the agenda and provide some uh, comments through email back to her before the next meeting for further discussion. Please go ahead. So um, for the next meeting then, we're talking about the September meeting or are we talking about August? Yeah, and that uh, that we need to discuss, I feel, is whether we, uh, if, you know, I know August is typically kind of uh, a break from council activities, but I'm, I'm most interested to hear from the group if you are interested or available in August or if uh, everybody wants to take that month back in September. So um, I guess we'll kind of take a uh, poll or a vote on that at, at the end of the meeting. Um, my concern is that with these priorities, they're fairly long-term and there's a lot of them. And I, I'm just concerned in our tenure in terms of how long the committee uh, what the horizon is, is that we can pick one or two and do a really good job, or we can spread ourselves really thin and kind of not get to any. So um, I'll reserve uh, any further discussion, but I just want everyone to think about uh, really what we can get done in the time that we have. Janet. Um, yes, through you, Chair, to the committee. I just got one clarification. Our actual next scheduled um, meeting for this committee is October 13th. Okay. So I think that's a very fair comment, Reed. And I wonder as we um, do our homework with this particular piece of the agenda that perhaps, uh, Janet, if you agree that each of us kind of pick two or three priority items because yes, our time is limited. So uh, I think that might be a fair way to approach it. We'll see if we can agree upon two or three to really focus on. So maybe like write up, like select our two or three and then kind of get a little write up of our what our current thoughts are on it so we can kind of get that ball rolling. And then- I think them. so. Okay. Does that make sense, Janet? Yeah, that would be great. 
And is there a date you'd like that by, Janet? Um, maybe what I can do is we can um, connect back after and we'll figure out a date and we can send out an email to everybody. Would that be appropriate? Absolutely. So we'll um, come back to that at the end of the meeting when we look at our next uh, meeting date. Okay. okay so is, is there anything more, Janet, that you wanted to address in, uh, in 6.1? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay, so, and any more questions from the group in relation to uh, what Janet has just presented to us? Good, okay. So we'll move forward then to items for discussion, which is the, the official plan questionnaire and the draft uh, official plan questions, which I know Janet sent out to us yesterday. And uh, Janet, if, if you don't mind to uh, take us through that, and I know everybody's got <laughs> comments that they want to share on uh, on these questions. Okay, so I'm going to put this up on the screen. Um, so I, um, I, you'll see some red text in here. And, and that was um, me going through trying to do a first take of with my best EDAC hat on for you guys of thinking about what you've talked about so far. Um, in your meetings and how that might uh, facilitate into what the survey uh, questions are for the official plan. So what um, there's, there's a number of questions going through it. Uh, I figured what I'd like to do is go through question by question and we'll stop and we'll, we'll have a discussion uh, on that if there's any comments on it. And then we can at the end of it also wrap back around what other things might be missing in addition to uh, so the, the opportunity for us here is to provide our input, feed that back to the consultant uh, for the official plan. And um, I believe their timeline is uh, September for that. And, and Rob will be able to provide us with more information on it. Uh, he's just got, sorry, I'm looking on our screen because he was actually, he's, he got kicked out and he's trying to get back in at the moment. Um, so he'll be able to provide us a little bit more of an update on the timing and how this will fit into that. Uh, Jennifer, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, yes, just before we get into the, the details about talking about each question, could you go into a little bit more detail about what, what they've, um, how they framed the objectives of this survey? I am unable to do that yet because I haven't been given all those objectives myself. Um, we've given, they've just given us an initial engagement plan and um, Rob and I are still getting an opportunity to go through that and digest it. Like you're literally getting it at the same time we're getting it. Okay. Um, and it's just because timing is, is of the essence with our, our meeting today and uh, giving the opportunity to be able to see those questions. So that's why I think even the feedback, any feedback that you have in that for clarification, I'd like to take that, collect that, because then at least I can go back and get that clarification and bring it back to you. Okay. And my other question before going into the, the each individual question is the mode of, the, or sorry, the medium, like how it's going to be distributed. Is, is it all online? Uh, I believe that they were looking at multiple medians, and again, that's going to um, that's going to shift as COVID, right? It, mm -hmm. With our opportunity to have more in-person meetings, um, I think that that's going to come into play and have some consideration because potentially some of these uh, interactions and engagement areas that they want to achieve, it might be more beneficial to have them in person now if we have that opportunity. So I think that it, there's going to be some pivoting here. And um, we're gonna have to just kind of work with that. Okay, <laughs> sorry, one more question. The text in red are suggestions or are they also like suggested changes? Those are, yeah, those are my suggested changes that I put in and in, in looking at it. Okay. Um, thinking of discussions that we've already had here. Okay, thank you. Reed? So I think um, just a little clarity, um, we have been using the OP, um, public engagement, and also talking at the same time about a community vision. And I think we 
now have some clarity that um, there's a desire to do the OP, but not the community vision at this time. Is that correct? Um, if I can, I'm going to bring this over through you uh, to the chair to answer because I know that you guys have had some additional discussions. Uh, and uh, Jen, I'll just ask, is Rob Armstrong back with us? Not yet. Because I think Rob may want to speak to this as well. Um, yes, the, the question of community vision is, is really important and the timing of that um, I know Reed and I have discussed and, and we met with Rob Armstrong to discuss this because the uh, um, piece about a community vision is, is really important as, as we move into this process and beyond. So, um, and Rob, please join in whenever you join us. Um, what we uh, suggested was that we complete the official plan process with questions included in this uh, survey that would that would uh, draw out information from our residents that would be relevant to the preparation of a community vision. So I think we need to be thinking of that as we're looking at the uh, information before us here on the screen, to think of what we need to really address a community vision, just because we don't want to be going to the public for this and then turning around just afterwards and coming to them again with similar questions, it might just be confusing and we might not get uh, good responses and recognizing as well that next year we will be heading into an election cycle and uh, typically when a new council is elected one of their first activities is to do a strategic priorities uh, planning exercise which uh, I'm assuming will happen shortly after the election which would be October of 2022 and uh, I know it's it was uh, Rob's suggestion to uh, kind of not combined, but to move into a community visioning process um, at that time as uh, council is doing its priorities and, uh, and involving the public in all of that process. But uh, again, I can't stress enough how important it is as we look at this list today, keep in mind what information we need from the public to lead into the discussion of a community vision. And uh, we, I may even uh, put it back to you perhaps to share with the group a little bit more about what exactly a community vision is. Please go ahead. Uh, so so <clears throat> um, I think because of the timing of this, um, uh, we need to understand that the priority is that this is going to be used primarily as a planning document uh, uh, for the the official plan. Uh, secondarily, if we can uh, gather any information that would uh, tee up the appetite for a community vision, uh, that is the secondary goal um, of this. So uh, I think rather than try and gather it all right now, um, are we gonna prioritize that this is, this is the OP and you know, if there's um, some bandwidth at the end of it to tee up an appetite for the community vision, we could have some additional questions. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. I, I would say in. yes, Reed. And uh, uh, Janet, you're saying Rob Armstrong's not back with us at this point. I wonder if there's a, a way that you can contact him and ask him to chime in on this. Rob is actually I'm, back on the I'm call. in, Shirley. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> great. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you you spoke and reads very clarified that the focus of this is, is the official plan. Ironically, um, when I look at our current official plan, uh, part A uh, uh, speaks to community vision. So under an official plan, it's called a community vision. Um, but I know that municipalities include community visions as part of their official plan to drive land use. But in addition, they include community visions as part of their strategic, uh, corporate strategic plans. And I, Reed's talking about the corporate one where um, what we're dealing with now is the planning one. So I, I agree that um, if we wanna look at some secondary questions uh, that we can pull, st start to pull some of that information on community vision 
under a strategic purposes out now that can feed in and start that process for the new council strategic priorities that would come forward post election, which is typically when municipalities do those corporate strategic uh, uh, priorities. Yeah, so I think that's, I think it is consistent. Uh, both of you have spoken well about it as praised in our discussion, so. Thanks, Rob. Any, any questions about that from the committee? Um, sorry, Rob. if I could just um, explain what you have in front of you, uh, the survey questions and how it, basically this was provided to us um, as a sample of another municipality they did. Um, I have not gone in and added anything to it. I have removed some things that were totally irrelevant, such as is it important being close to the border? So it was a border <laughs> municipality. <laughs> so I did remove some of those very irrelevant comments, but some of them are very, so this is just the starting point. It hasn't had any staff input, uh, haven't had any discussions with the consultant. I thought it would be great opportunity just to throw this up here as the starting point and it's an open book. Uh, glad to hear any input on this uh, as we go through it. That's great, Rob. So I'll turn it back over to you, Janet, and let's take it question by question. Perfect. So the first uh, question is that was identified as what is your favorite thing about living in Meaford? Um, you'll see that I put in underneath what is what do you most like about living in Meaford? And the only reason I reworded that question is because um, one thing sounds very singular and um, it sounds like a sort of an object. And I think that you, you know, questions be, could be answered more with it could be about the people. It could be, you know, about the natural environment. It could be about tourism, culture, arts. Like it could be a whole bunch of different things. So um, that was my only suggestion for the first question is maybe it's reworded to what do you most like about living in Meaford? Rob, I, Yurig, I see you have a raised hand. Yeah, um, I, uh, the question is good. The only thing I would say is I'd like to see it more open-ended because literally I could answer that, that question by saying the water. I could literally answer that by saying the people. The and why open-ended question provokes more thought, more input um, than just a singular answer. And I would hope that we're trying to achieve more than just a one-offs. So just to clarify, you're suggesting that we say, we ask what and then why? Yeah, what do you like most about yep. living in Meaford and why? Mm -hmm. um, and Janet, I see what you're saying about the, uh, the wording that a thing might not be people. I, I personally didn't get that, but um, I guess that's something that can comes out to if you assume maybe they test this out on a few people. Um, but I like the wording of like, what is your favorite thing? Just the, the favorite part. Um, and, and I agree with Rob about the why having that as well. Perfect, got that. Reed, your, your hand is up. Yes. I think just as a warm up question, I think that's a great way to start a, a questionnaire. Um, I do think as we get into the questions, we need to think about how we're going to use, like, what are we drilling at? Like, what are we, how are we going to use this? Um, I mean, this is kind of uh, a nice one, the most favorite thing. Uh, we'll, we'll end up with a list. We might be able to use that in some sort of, um, um, you know, in various ways, but I'm not sure, um, you know, every question, as we drill down, as we get further along, we're going to want to say, what's it give us and what are we going to do with it? Yeah, absolutely agree. To that point, I agree, Reed, because my fear is with the favorite is that you just get a greatest hits. Yeah. But no real justification as to why or any logic as to why those that list exists or what people enjoyed about them. Yeah. 
sorry, just on that as well, I was just looking through the rest of the questions and other than um, the question about what intersection um, the person responding to it lives at, there are no, um, there are no other questions identifying um, like their characteristics. So how long have they been living here, for example, things like that um, would be relevant to if you want to link it back to what's your favorite thing about living in Meaford, for example. Somebody that's been living here for 20 years might have a different view of somebody who's been living here for one, but we won't be able to capture that as is right now. So I would, I guess, suggest thinking about what else do we want to know about who is filling out the survey? Um, through the chair, I guess. Wait, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, um, question number two. Um, I relate that kind of to profiling. I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. I'm not sure how important it is. Um, what are we, you know, kind of what are we getting at? I think um, if we want to know if they're urban or rural, that's that's reasonable. If it's, um, you know, maybe how long uh, someone's lived somewhere, um, you know, but beyond that, I, I kind of, think that uh, if they're a resident here, uh, that's probably pretty good. That's good enough. Well, if, if I may, um, I, I, I think that there should be at least some sort of demographic markers um, because I mean, like even just the different area, like so major intersection, I don't think applies because the major intersection near me has 20 houses and a major section at Boucher and Fuller is soon gonna have, you know, a few hundred. So, um, that specific question is is out, but like what sort of area or sort of former hamlet might might matter because somebody in Annan might have a different perspective than somebody in um, sort of like just out of the sort of the sort of uh, downtown bubble. Um, there might be some different perspectives given the history and the culture and things like that. Um, things like age might have a big difference um, because young people are going to be focused on different things than older people and being able to see how um, the statistics get swayed by that factor um, can, can make a difference. And then comparing that to the number of, well, is our community mostly young people or mostly older people will allow us to actually properly weigh our priorities. Um, and being able to look at number of respondents in those groups will also, I think, have a difference. Um, and then just what we were saying before about having sort of that first question as being favorite thing, um, I think we could debate the wording for a little while, but I think it also might be worthwhile to kind of get the, the counter side because we don't want people to just think that we're trying to prompt them to think only about good things when really there's you know going to be a number of things that are going to immediately strike them as issues. Um, and if they feel like we're targeting only good stuff, they might feel like we're not really taking it seriously if they have concerns. Good points, Eric. And as I look at number two, uh, what concerns me there is then people are going to look at that and think they can only respond if they live here. And do we want this survey focused only on residents or do we want to hear from uh, visitors or people who are here for short periods of time, uh, locum doctors, for example? I mean, do we want this focused? Um, with the words live here. If I may, then I think it would be another demographic feature to separate those people, um, like, and try to understand like where they're coming from, because yeah, definitely. I mean, we, if we can get the opinion of occasional residents versus permanent residents, what pr amenities we focus on are going to matter depending on whose whose input we're receiving. And I would and, just and say who we market those changes to as well. Sorry. Sorry, and I was just going to say to everyone, please just jump in. Don't worry about the formalities. Let's uh, let's just jump into this conversation and uh, as we go forward here. Uh, in terms of the profile age, I think I think there's uh, I think that's a good idea. Whether they rent or own or seasonal, I can see some of those questions being relevant. But major intersection, um, I don't know, rural or urban would would cut it. I, I don't know how it's going to be used. So I, I'm going to counter you, 
um, there, Reed, because I, I think those questions are are important. Um, but we can also, <laughs> like, not necessarily the nearest major intersection, but um, if, we, if we just say rural and urban, um, then you have to, <laughs> maybe it's the academic in me, but it's like, what is rural and what is urban if I live sort of on the outskirts of, uh, of, of Meaford? Um, so what about if we identified it by, I'm still newish here, so do we call them hamlets or communities mm -hmm. like Annan and Woodford and so forth? Because when we're talking about the municipality, I mean, it's, it's quite wide. So um, could they identify themselves that way? Or like what, like your, I, and I don't know how this is divided again, because I just haven't been looking at many people's driver's licenses, but mine says Ann and are, do all of the other areas have those distinguishing features on their, on their driver's license or official address? Like, I don't know at what point your address stops saying Meaford. So maybe that's, you know, not a, a good way to separate it. But I think that the different areas within what we would class as rural, generally speaking, or uh, label as rural, um, there's well, different camps in that as well that will have very, very varying or quite varying answers. Trying to unify the municipality, maybe it's quadrants or maybe it's, I'm just saying the, for the longer we kind of prolong the hamlets, areas, rural, urban, I don't know how we kind of get around it, but um, it's challenging not to profile, oh, these people think that. Um, and I think we want to get away from that. Actually, Is it just go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Jennifer. Um, one of the things I was going to say, and and the deputy mayor will definitely really we've we've gone to great lengths to continue to recognize our hamlet and our communities as as being all part of Meaford, and I think a lot of people like to identify themselves as being from uh, those different communities, Bogner, Woodford. And that, and, and they will identify them as being from those areas, especially with us getting these intersection signs and where there are. Um, so I think to me, it, it's good to to do that. They will know what community that they're from, and, and we can pull that in that regard. Um, it's it's probably best. Um, the other thing I was going to just back to the the comment on the first question, and we again we look back to an official plan. Uh, which is the document we're doing. The full intent of that official, of an official plan is to guide development um, and protect those features which the public considers important. So going back to question number one, what's the favorite thing or, or what do you like most about living? It's to determine what those things that need to be protected really are. Uh, on the flip side, what don't you like? Um, well, I don't know how the official plan could work that way. It's, it's to protect those things that you like. I love the open space character. I love the protection of the environment and, and things like that. So it's really to pull that key item and that really drives the importance of development of policies in relation to development. So just as we go through these questions, just keep that in mind and in doing that, I think it's important. Fair. Thanks for that, Rob. And back to Reed's uh, comment about profiling, uh, I don't see that as profiling when you're asking like socio-demographic questions. And, um, I see it more as, as trying to understand who, um, who the respondent is. Um, like anything we ask in this, in this survey or market research, we can use it for good or evil, I guess. <laughs> um, there's, there's ethics involved and we could use it as profiling, but um, I don't think that would be the intention, um, I would see it more as, as trying to see if there's synergy between certain communities or, or where some of the differences lie. Um, th that would be my take on that. Fair enough. I, I guess uh, drilling down to the nearest major intersection, I find a little uh, difficult. I, I understand the various hamlets and, and small, community, small communities within a large municipality, but um, uh, anyways, uh, how, how far do we drill down? Yeah, major intersection definitely isn't my favorite, but maybe like a region or like sort of, I don't wanna say sub community because that doesn't sound right either, but yeah, the major intersection wording isn't doesn't fit, I don't think. 
So could we actually list then Urban Meeker, Bobner, Ann, and Lee Woodford and have people yep. sort of choose one of those wherever they're focused to? I would is, agree with that. Is there a set of like, these are the defined areas? Because like, I mean, there's a lot that are just like a single intersection, but might not necessarily be like, you know, I could say I'm in Irish block or I could say I'm in Annan, or do you say you're in Annan? Do you say you're in Leith? Um, uh, hopefully there's a description somewhere that we can like a, a standardized way of defining those areas. Yeah, there are 24 actual little hamlets and settlement areas. We could list them all. And that way you catch people who are in Holt's Head or Soko or any of those uh, smaller recognized communities? I think having 24 would make any type of way, weight type statistics too difficult. Mm -hmm. Five mm -hmm. or six could could be okay, but, but 24 is, is certainly too much. But you can regroup them afterwards. Fair enough. Yeah, but that's a good point. We're not, yeah. With the, the population, you're, you're not going to get enough for, for each of those, but we can then regroup them. Can I maybe propose that, so we, I think there's been some really good discussion on question two around how you handle um, that demographic piece. And um, I've got some good input here about the Hamlet settlement areas. Why don't we take that back to the consultant and, you know, as um, work off their advice and their their background to see how they might best handle that and we'll give them our comments and let them come back with some suggestions to us on how to best handle it and how they would actually pull that information together. Makes sense. Um, so maybe what we can do is we can move on to the next set of questions, uh, number three. And number three is a series of um, lists and what it is, is it's asking the um, respondent to mark down uh, besides, beside each of the groups what they consider um, most important to them. And the first section that, that is identified is community and quality of life. So they've identified range and mix of housing and housing affordability. Um, I added in the word availability of housing because I think this group has talked very heavily about, you know, what is the availability, uh, age friendliness and accessibility, um, welcoming and inclusive community. So again, trying to figure out, thinking about that diversity, you got, it's almost like that demographics thing. And we'd have to think again about going back into that whole land use planning. How does that fit into land use planning? Uh, recreation opportunities, facilities, parks, walkability, active transportation, and uh, community connection, culture, arts, events, and heritage conservation, protection of the rural character, and then the last one added in is health, wellness, and community safety. So any comments on that list for quality of life? And you may find that some things that you're thinking of you almost might feel like they fit in multiple areas, but it's just trying to figure out maybe where is the best fit for them. Um, I don't think I have anything to say about any of the topics. I might, um, with other prompting, come up with other ones to add. But the um, operationalization of that question, saying just place a mark beside it, I feel like it's not going to be usable enough data because I think most most of these issues seem to be pretty common issues. Um, so ultimately, I think 90% of people are going to say yes to everything. Um, I think there's very few things here that people are going to say, no, that doesn't matter to me. So it might be better to send the consultant to the drawing board to come up with a better way of scaling them or creating some way to prioritize. Um, but I think ultimately, like all of these are important issues. That's why they came up and why they're on the survey um, in the first place. I agree with Eric. I think some way of prioritizing them, ranking them, some sort of, yeah, because I would check off every one, I think, but <laughs> what's most important to not as important? There's gotta be some way to do that. And, and what is their impact on the official plan? Great. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. 
Uh, again, <clears throat> I guess um, understanding how this information will be used would be really key at getting how to ask it. Like how, like how do we, what are we gonna do if everybody goes down and checks them all? What would we do with that? Um, and how would it impact them? I think this question, question number three, um, kind of tees up uh, the appetite to do a community vision. And so I'm wondering if it shouldn't be uh, something like um, where we ask the uh, respondent, uh, do you think MIFER should have a long-term plan uh, based on the, the following themes or a five to 10 year plan based on the following themes? Yes or no, or, or strongly agree or disagree. And then we have the drop down for all of those things. What is the most important out of these uh, under each theme, you know, pick the top three or something to that effect. But I, I would see the outcome of this being the basis to test the appetite on whether there's an appetite for a longer term community vision. I think that's really good discussion to have with the consultant to just considering the possibility of uh, them continuing to help us with that community vision process if we get that far. Um, in, in terms of how we asked the question, I agree that um, just getting people to place a mark beside the ones that I feel are most important probably won't give us um, much, um, especially it says that these, th okay, these three groups. So, um, but it doesn't stimulate, stipulate the number. So oh, a couple of ways we could do this is uh, a suggested rank your top three or each one becomes like a scale of one to five, which becomes a bit onerous where you have to rank them. Like how important is this to you on a scale of one to five is sometimes how they ask that question. But when you have, um, you have about, I don't know, 15 of them, it becomes a bit onerous. Um, yeah, the other way you could do that uh, is to initially ask it as an open-ended question to see what comes out and then ask them to rank the list that we have here. Just like sort of top of mind, what comes to mind in terms of what issues are important to you. Uh, sometimes it brings up things that haven't been listed um, and I guess, Janet, my question to you is the, the things that you've added and, and, um, here in sort of wording, is this um, based on some of the, the previous um, work that has been done in terms of surveys, residents, of what they identified as being important? No, the red that I've added here is based on me listening to um, this group in the last okay. couple of meetings of what you've highlighted as being important. Okay. Would it make the questionnaire too long if we added a comment box underneath each point to allow people then, you know, we recognize that every one of those is important and then to encourage them to comment on each one? I think you can set it up that there's an option to put text into each one and then they can just choose whether they want to add, add their comments to it. Um, I, but I guess the alternative is the way they've got it structured here is just the comments at the end of each of the, the sections. Well, maybe it would be worthwhile to say, like, um, to give an opportunity to say, you know, here are some issues that uh, the municipality has, you know, kind of identified as being important. Please feel free to provide any that you think are important that may have been missed. And then looking at that list that you now have um, between what we've inputted in, and what you have now inputted as a respondent, um, suggest ways to act on these things. So that way the survey brings back potentially new ideas and actual actionables to kind of give the, the plan some teeth and what they would like to see happen. And say, you know, like we would like to do this specific thing to, to advance this, this, this goal. Mm -hmm. Yep, I like that. Yeah, okay. I think that's good. So I think that's a great takeaway and have, uh, again, feedback back and, and see how they can set the questionnaire up to address it. 
the oh, next. Sorry, oh, okay. <laughs> can, no, can I say one more quick thing? Um, in terms of the wording of each of these uh, items here, like is, is there a possibility of, of wording it in a more plain language way? Things like climate change resiliency and like walk, um, I don't know. I just think that there's ways to say these things that, that don't have to be sort of the formal themes that, that we might um, refer to them at, at different levels. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, people in Meaford aren't educated, but I would find some of these terms, like they're a little bit cumbersome. If you wanna get, make sure that you're getting the survey out to a range of different people, then I would suggest um, simplifying the wording of some of these. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great comment. And certainly before this would go out from a communications perspective, we'd wanna make sure that it was meeting our AODA requirements as mm -hmm. well as meeting our uh, plain language for um, maximum readability and accessibility. And speaking of that, what is AODA? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm sorry, acronym. Yeah. That is um, our Accessibilities Act that we oh, have okay. to meet for um, anything that we prepare for writing and, and placing on our, our content on our web pages and forward facing to the public. Perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Jan. Can I just ask how are we in, how are you intending to disseminate the survey w regarding it being onerous? It's one thing if it's literally an online survey where somebody is, and and it becomes less onerous when you're checking boxes and typing in an answer. But obviously, some of our less technical or senior people may not be able to do that. So um, just, is this gonna be a hard copy survey as well? Because again, so what becomes onerous by length is defined by its, um, its structure. And that's, we'll work through that with that communication and engagement plan with the consultant for how it goes out because you're right, we're gonna to have to have it in different uh, available formats in order to meet our population as far as to get to the different areas. So it may be the fact that some of this might be very much a digital form and then we have some hard copy forms. So how you fill that out, there's gonna have to be some consistency. It may be even that we look at different ways of that it's available on some of our public computers, say like at the library that people can come into and access if they want to. So that's gonna to have to all be addressed through that engagement plan to um, disseminate this. So the next section is on environment and the items that were identified for environment. And again, thinking land use planning, keep coming back to remind us that this is for land use planning is climate change resiliency, uh, protection of natural heritage features, preservation of agricultural land, preservation of urban green space and green energy opportunities. That seem fairly straightforward to this group, minus the plain, I totally get the plain language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I could talk about this one for hours. So um, I'll try to keep it to one sentence. Um, again, I guess it's, uh, just thinking of the, I'm thinking about what we're trying to get from people here, like from the residents. Um, in my mind, it's it's looking at the priorities of all of our our natural areas, not built areas, right? So looking at, you know, are there importance for well climate change? So obviously, looking at what are we doing for protection of lands or or zoning that would allow for climate change, addressing climate change, um, protection of our natural heritage features. So obviously getting into our natural landscapes, the, the Niagara Escarpment Commission, things like that, our agricultural lands. So are we um, looking at preservations of them or are we looking at um, opportunities for more flexibility that would allow more residential development, let's say, like that That could be some of the stuff that I'm, I'm thinking in my head that would this would be trying to lend to answer. Um, preservation of our urban green spaces. So existing green spaces that we have and uh, what is the focus and the priority on those? And then obviously green energy opportunities would be uh, anything that would be touching into additional um, 
um, I guess, land uses that would support the green energy, like maybe it's solar and, and those types of things. Well, so maybe, oh, sorry, Reed, I see your hand come up. Oh. You go first. Well, I guess I just want to echo what Jennifer was saying about um, normal uh, speak, I guess, um, preservation of urban green space. I think to many people that wouldn't mean a park, but you know, if we were to put that actually out there, I think the respondent might um, react a little differently. I think kind of understanding how this is going to be used would really help our group. Like, what are we going to do with the information that's gathered? And um, I don't know if that's that's easily communicated, but um, I do echo the fact, let's try and make it as easy as we can for people to sort of get what the importance is of it. Uh, parks and recreation, green space, walkability, all of that, I think is uh, what people understand. Yeah, and there might even in there read too with green spaces, like with the parks and trails, it could also be just wood lots, private yeah. or public. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. well, so I, I think I, the way this is set up now, it, it just isn't simple and we want this to be simple. And I don't know if it needs some examples because I think, you know, our harbor, our Georgian Bay isn't mentioned here, whether, I know, I know it falls into natural heritage, but I just don't know if we need to simplify wording here or give some examples or structure it in a different way so that it's just, that people don't have to stop here and really think about it because it's pretty, it's pretty complex, all of these different uh, points that are mentioned here. I just think there's got to be a way to to get a response here and in, in making this a little uh, simpler for people to respond to. Well, I, I think it's similar to um, like the point above um, and with uh, what Rob Armstrong had said when we started this, that it, you know, it is sort of a, a template survey. So it, you know, it isn't sort of tailored to uh, Meaford and what, what we have here. Um, so it's, you know, a matter of really, how are we going to use it again? So, you know, here's our, here's what the municipality and same for the, the following sort of sections. Here's what the municipality is already cur currently thinking of with the people that we have contacted and groups that we have had way in. What do you, the respondent think uh, sh it should be here, but isn't and kind of on these items, you know, throw some, some actionable goals and, and tasks at us. And, you know, maybe these are things that we can do. I mean, I think all, again, all of us think that, uh, you know, we want to reduce climate change. We want to have green energy without, you know, emissions. We all want to have, um, you know, good, healthy soil and, and lack of pollution. Um, so, like, what, what do you propose that we do about it? What are some, some ideas? And maybe we can sort of harness the creativity that random residents and community members are going to have um, to give us those ideas. Um, because, you know, like Janet said, with private woodlots, maybe somebody who has a private woodlot has an idea of how to incorporate that into a larger plan that none of us are just even thinking about. Um, because otherwise, if we're just saying, you know, does this matter to you? I think, again, it's a blanket yes. You know, we all mm -hmm. care about these things, but what do we actually do about it? We know that um, these are important issues. We just don't know what to do. And, uh, um, I agree with what you're saying, Eric, and and we, the comment was made about number three as well. It's like we would just tick each one of those because, yeah, we care. Mm -hmm. um, I do like questions for or because what they do is, is disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. <laughs> um, you now have quantification. And again, when somebody is actually benchmarking this, they can say X amount of people strongly agree with this. How many people disagree with this? Whereas this is truly black or white i'm either and, and if i don't check climate change resiliency am i a climate change nazi who says i don't like this stuff um so it's it's so gray to me whereas i think some kind of quantification provides more data for study down the road and still with as eric said room for commentary so that anybody can add uh any coloring they want to do I'm wondering if we need to be sensitive to the last point, green energy opportunities, because mm -hmm. I just don't want to see this turn into a whole negative piece about TC. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same. Perfectly, <laughs> yeah, yes. perfectly honest. So um, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw that. Oh, that's going to open a can of worms. 
Um, there's Maybe when the, you ask the consultant. Sorry, Jennifer. Uh, I think um, just on your point before, uh, Debbie Mayor, about the the wording, and I, like as I mentioned before, I, I agree with that, and I think there's a way here. I think that we can can really work at um, posing these questions in a way that is more, I guess, palatable to people. Um, people responding to it. And, and that's what I liked about the first question is like, what is your favorite thing about living in Meaford? It's just, it's more conversational about, you know, that you'd ask somebody in person, you, you wouldn't ask them, um, like if you're having a conversation with somebody, you probably wouldn't say, what do you think about climate change resiliency or preservation of urban green space? So I think trying to make it as conversational as possible um, through, through the wording is important and do we really need this question as is um in terms of these these categories um is there another way that we can ask this and it, it sort of circles back to as, as we've said like what what are we really trying to get at here um and then just one point about the environment categories um do we want to say something, if we are leaving the question sort of in this format, do we want to put something in there about tourism as it relates to the environment? I know we have tourism in the economy as well, so it, it does overlap a few, a few different things. Janet, does that give you some thoughts to go back to the consultant with for um, some clarifications and uh, change of language? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm just going to give the consultant this whole video. <laughs> <laughs> make them earn their, yeah, make them earn their keep. Okay, and I just so wanted to quickly clarify. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm for or opposed to TC Energy. I just want uh, people to have the opportunity to respond to this without, you know, um, making it, you know, about their feelings about that particular proposal, just uh, trying to provide a little clarity there. And mm -hmm. I think just on that, um, maybe clarification on green energy. Is it is it green energy policies that relates to individual properties, people doing green um, different standards? The big thing about that as a point of clarification, the official plan doesn't apply to the base. So Mm. We can't regulate land use, so that qualifier to say <laughs> it, it doesn't apply to that. No one leave, you're right, we don't want to leave people down that alley for sure. So, um, I think this is great information on three. Um, great discussion on that, and we can definitely talk to the consultant, as Janet said, for sure. Um, I think with regard to four, and I heard some positive approaches to four, how we're asking that specific question agree, disagree. I think what I would ask of this group just to, to move this along, is there any items you don't, of these questions you don't think we should be asking or is the ones that we uh, maybe have missed and want to ask as well? Um, I think this is a good approach to, to get how and, and can really lead the policy development in that regard. Yeah, I think if I may, uh, the uh, the first point, Meaford needs to grow to accommodate more housing and jobs. Janet and I had a pretty good discussion about this one yesterday, and we changed the jobs to workforce because from my perspective, we need to attract people to work in Meaford. We have the jobs, but I wanted to hear the committee's perspective on that. Eric? I think you had your hand up. Um, I, I didn't speak because I saw Reed's hand go up first. Oh, okay. So um, I, I agree that the uh, the ranking, the disagree, uh, agree, neutral is a great gauge. I think uh, this whole question number four needs a little preamble to uh, for people to get their head around it because um, Meaford needs to grow to accommodate more housing and jobs. Um, I don't think somebody, I mean, I'm not sure that it's helpful for somebody to say, oh, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, I think we probably need a sentence or two that says, you know, Gray County is projecting this growth 
the province is projecting that growth. If Meadford were to plan to grow, what are the important aspects? You know, is it, should it be through, you know, um, housing that, you know, like give them a drop down list of the things that they should be thinking about to plan for. Um, and, you know, then you can go on to the next questions about, about uh, growth in Meaford has been appropriate play, appropriately placed. Um, I'm not sure most people will know what that means. Are you saying that the stores are downtown and the housing is beyond that? Like, I'm not sure that they're gonna, I think that needs a little descriptor. Yeah. yeah, I think that was a good point because uh, <laughs> we were looking at it yesterday. We were struggling with that one a bit too. The appropriately placed was um, throwing up some question marks on how to best uh, position that and get content or get people to be able to respond to it. Yeah, I agree with Reed. Some preamble would be helpful too. And perhaps we could provide some statistics there to let people know about um, our rental vacancy rate, for example. Um, our unemployment rate being the lowest in Ontario, some of those statistics that we can pull from uh, uh, census and county and, and uh, RTO7 and so on, just to give people uh, enough background information to be informed to answer the question. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, yes. And when we come down to housing growth and need for it should be accommodated through high density, um, I think it sh there should be more options there. I think that high density is one of them. Um, but what types of property are we talking about? Just vacant land? Like, are we talking farmland? Are we talking downtown, waterfront? I think there's some, I think there's a need to kind of qualify um, really what we're discussing in terms of taller buildings. And I like the idea of adding options there because, uh, you know, pocket neighborhoods and tiny homes and, and uh, multi-residential or whatever you choose to add in a list gives people a chance to look at different forms. Well, perhaps, perhaps we should have a question. How important should high density locations consider walkability, sidewalks, future transit, schools, shopping, right? Because that would be a planning consideration. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Jennifer, I see you got your hand up. Uh, yes, I guess my question with this question is uh, how how these different uh, areas of emphasis, I guess, were uh, selected. I know they were based on uh, previous survey. I guess the, the, there are two questions about cannabis. Do we do we need those questions? Is there is is that an important issue uh, to be looking at? Could could we? Um, yeah, I guess I just leave that. Is, is is that a key thing? If we only have five things, do we want five or six things? Do we want that to be two two fifths of that? I would just echo the fact, J Jennifer, that we don't have any other industries kind of mentioned like that. And so to have two <laughs> questions uh, regarding that, um, it, it seems a little out of place to me. <laughs> Especially yeah, I mean, since we just had that huge uh, I know. <laughs> news. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess it's probably was specific to, imagine this was, was this Windsor that was, uh, the survey was for. Um, Maybe it was a more specific issue in that particular community. It would be nice though to have a question sort of related to agriculture in some fashion. I don't have the language for it, but um, might be nice to direct something towards agriculture. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I think that the one question about agricultural and farm businesses, uh, base business, that, that's a fair question. Should they, you know, uh, farm gate, Farm gate is an important aspect of both agritourism um, as well as farming. So, yeah, absolutely. 
which leads to the discussion about um, whether farms can be, um, oh, the number of lots that can be uh, broken down on a farm now, I believe it's 60 acres. So we leads into the discussion mm -hmm. of whether that is still appropriate or if, um, you know, I know sometimes the county makes arrangements with uh, the owners of farm properties to allow rental of uh, spaces, um, 25 acre parcels and so on. So I think it leads into that conversation about more appropriate use of farms in particular, those that have been bought by people who are not farming the land, that they're just uh, you know living in the residence and, and not utilizing the land. So maybe we can get somewhere with that. Is there anything, because we've talked about the farming, is there anything else that you want to highlight while we're at that section on the agricultural? Not that I can think of, Janet, but again, I would encourage the committee as, you know, as we uh, leave the meeting to continue thinking about these questions and send any comments back through to uh, Janet as, uh, as we all lay awake thinking about this. Please. Just uh, one last thing. The one question that says, I'm in support of my neighbor who wants to add a second dwelling uh, or apartment to their house. I think that question uh, is an important question, but I think it could use a bit of a preamble about um, uh, supply and demand of housing is important across all spectrums. And because of that, um, you know, additional housing will help both attainable and high end. Uh, then we start to ask the question questions, right? So secondary suites is just one tool in the toolbox, right? So secondary suites, um, stacked townhouses, high rises, uh, all of those things. What uh, if there is a agreement or disagreement? Um, now's the time. Now, that's when you would put that in to see where people are at. Yeah, I like that read because you think of developments and we've all seen them where they actually in new homes build in that secondary entrance so someone can rent their basement. I wonder if there's um, an opportunity and, and it'll come out in relation to our Ontario building code and the minimum square footage, again, if we're looking at smaller types of accommodations, which could apply to the secondary suite laws and comes back to the, uh, the tiny home piece and so on. I wonder if we should structure a question in some format related to um, minimum square footage. I would be highly in favor of something like that. I think if the results can be used, it should be done. So would that be used to say like houses have to be, or an, like a dwelling has to be at least whatever size? Is that how that works? Like what we're okay. getting at? As long as it meets all the requirements of the building code. But right, right now, um, Eric, if I understand your question, there is, like you have to build a house that's at least, I can't remember what it is, like 1,400 square feet or something. Yeah, um, going to tell us. Whereas, um, um, oh, sorry, Rob, you go ahead. Uh, the municipality doesn't have any minimum building size. We got rid of that when we updated the bylaw, uh, except for in the country residential zone. That's the only place we have minimum building sizes. Basically, the Ontario, we let the Ontario Building Code govern uh, the building size. Um, so yeah, we, we're pretty flexible already on that. It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah, I would fear there would be a, a potential of elitism there where you can only rent your place out if you are able to build a large enough house to do it. Um, that's kind of a, a limiting factor. If somebody who is not of means wants to try to supplement income by building a small house and has the wherewithal to be able to do it reasonably, should we limit that? 
And if somebody is okay to rent it, I mean, that's right. You know, let the market decide. Yeah. Okay, everyone. I think we've had really good discussion on these uh, questions. And uh, Janet's got a lot of information to work with. And uh, let's, um, let's try to move forward. We're already well past our uh, additional 4.30 uh, um, exit time. So let's agree that uh, any further comments that you may have as a committee, please uh, uh, send them on in to, uh, to Janet on, on this and on the, uh, on, the, on the work plan. And if that's okay with everyone, then we'll, uh, we'll leave uh, this piece. We've had a great discussion and I really thank everybody for your input. Um, so moving on to number eight, uh, there were no communications for us this time. Um, and the date of the next meeting, which is, as we see, is scheduled for October 13th. So I thought we should talk about that. That's quite a long time from now. And I wanted to see how the group felt about meeting prior to that. And uh, Rob, perhaps you'll have some guidance for us on that. Okay. So the next meeting scheduled for October, it said? October 13th. Yeah, I, I agree and, and have a meeting uh, with the consultant. However, um, I think we should be looking at, at September, not August. Our capacity to do anything in the next little bit uh, due to staff challenges, which you're very much aware of, Deputy Mayor, that uh, I would like to suggest that we uh, look at possibly September with the, the consultant. They'll be well into it by then. Um, I think that's when ideal timing if that's okay. Okay, so we'll leave it then with you and Janet to converse with a consultant and come back to the group with uh, a recommended date for hopefully early in September. Correct, yes. Okay, does that uh, sound okay with the group? And in the meantime, we'll all uh, work on the homework that we've uh, been provided and get some mm -hmm. comments back into Janet. And that's been a really excellent discussion today, you guys. You're a great group work with. Thank you for all of your input. Any final comment anyone wants to make before we adjourn? Do we want to put a deadline on when to send comments in? Um, like mid-August mid or something like that? Like how much time would Janet need? Well, I was actually wondering if for the survey, because it's top of your mind and you've been working through it, if we could actually have a deadline of next week, because I think the sooner that we can get it over to the consultant, because you, you have had so much feedback, um, to give them the ample time that they need to be able to look at it, digest it, turn it around for September. So can we maybe set a time of, um, you know, end of day, Friday next week? And that date, Janet, is? I'm just looking that up. 23rd, I think. Yes. yes. So end of day on the 23rd, and uh, we'll all aim for that. And uh, again, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Please get out and enjoy the rest of this sunny day. And, uh, and really, really appreciate all your hard work today. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.